So you've finally created a brand new Next.js project and now you think to yourself, where should I deploy my new Next.js project? You have different options like Vercel, Netlify, Fly.io, Render, Cloudflare. And first of all, they all have pros and cons, different price points, different, I guess, core technology but also they operate on different realms. One group operates on serverless functions, the other group operates on long-lived servers. Both of these options also have pros and cons, and actually the choice is not that easy as you would think. And without even talking way further, let me show you my screen right here and the diagram which I've prepared for today's video. So the first thing you see right here is actually, we first of all have to choose between serverless or long-lived servers. Now, first of all, what is the difference? Let's start off with serverless. What is serverless? Now, if you talk about serverless, you actually talk about serverless functions. And what does that mean? Well, that means that your code lives in a function, mostly in the AWS function or in a Cloudflare Edge function. I will come to the difference uh, a bit later, but that means actually that if the user, so in that case, for example, me, visits your website, this serverless function spins up and then actually serves the request to me, so to the user. And um, that the nice thing with that is actually that if your website does not get any traffic and no serverless function has to start, you don't pay anything because there's no server running. Now with long-lived servers, it's a bit different actually. So you have one big server, you don't have now multiple small serverless functions, but you have one big server. And then this big server serves all of the incoming requests. So let's say I and I don't know, 10 uh, more users actually visit your website, then this one server will actually serve all of these 10 users, including me. Now, the nice thing with that is, and I haven't talked about that in a drawback of the serverless functions, um, with serverless functions, you have a problem and that's actually cold starts. Now that only actually implies to note to the node runtime. And I will later on again, talk about the difference between the edge runtime and the node runtime. But with serverless functions, again, you have a cold start. So that means if your serverless function is not warm, so no one is currently using your website, and now I come to your website, um, this serverless function has to spin up. And that means actually that this now serverless function could take one second, two seconds, three seconds, five seconds, depending on your bundle size to actually start up. And that means that the user sits on your website, waits for it and only sees a blank screen. Because again, your function is currently not running, but is starting up. With long-lived servers, you don't have this issue. Your server is running 100% of the time. And that means, I don't know if even... 10 days in a row, no user visited your website and now I come to your website, I would still get a very fast surf because again, there's no cold start. Your server is running 100% of the time. But this is actually also a drawback. If your server runs 100% of the time, you also pay 100% of the time. With serverless functions, you only pay for the actual, I guess, serverless function execution. I think it's called like that. So if you have 10 serverless executions or function executions, you pay for these 10 executions. With long-lived servers, you pay 100% of the time. So the whole time where your server actually runs. And then you also have to actually look at like CPU and then also memory usage and then adjust that and whatever there is also. Now, one more thing I want to actually talk about is scalability. Now, the nice thing with serverless functions is that you don't have to think about scalability. So even if today, for example, your website only has 10 serves, but tomorrow some big news happens and then your website gets 100,000 serves, you don't have to think about anything because each serverless function will actually um, serve each individual request. So you don't have to think about CPU usage or memory usage or adjusting your, uh, I guess, pricing or whatever there is. You just pay for the execution. So you don't have to think about anything. Everything is managed and that's very nice. With long-lived servers, it's a bit different. So if, for example, today your website gets 10 serves, everything will happen normally. You have your normal CPU usage and memory usage. You don't have any spikes. Everything is good. But if tomorrow, again, some news breaks and you have 100,000 serves, I can guarantee you that you will actually have downtime. 
because with long lived servers, you have to manage CPU and memory yourself. That means that you actually also have to scale yourself. There's no automatic scaling, but you have to scale yourself and then adjust the CPU and memory based, I guess, on the usage. So yeah, you see there's quite a divergence between serverless functions and long lived servers. There are pros and cons to both. And I can't really say that one is better than the other one. It all depends on your use case. And if you run a product, for example, which heavily depends on scaling and for example, spikes. But now where we actually understand the difference between long-lived servers and serverless functions, I think we can now actually look at the serverless landscape and look at the individual providers to which you can actually deploy your applications. Now there's actually one thing all of them have in common and that's that they all work with Git deploy. That means that if you push your code to GitHub, all you have to do is go inside of the website, so to the Netlify website or to the Vassal website, click import and everything is done for you. And that's quite nice. You don't have to think about CLIs or Docker files. Everything is done for you with just a Git push and then import the Git repository. But with that out of the way, let's look at Netlify. Now, if you didn't know when Netlify started, it was actually first of all static first. So they only actually deployed static websites. Now as time evolved and also Netlify evolved as a company, they actually also now uh, manage or actually allow you to deploy full stack applications as also Vassal does. And that's actually quite nice because in that case, all business applications or all technical applications, however you want to say it, work on this provider. Now, there's actually one thing I want to talk right now about, and that's right here I said Node and V8. So Netlify allows you to deploy on the Node one time and also on the V8 one time. What's the difference? With serverless functions, you have two function types. You have a function type which runs on a node one time, and then you also have the edge function which runs on a V8 one time. Now with the node one time, you have all the, I guess, benefits of the node one time. You can use everything. With the edge function, or in that case, the V8 one time, you don't have this benefit. Not all node packages or not all packages which rely on the node runtime work on the V8 runtime. So for example, if you build an authentication system, you will probably need the crypto package to make hashing work. And for example, this package relies on a node runtime. And that means that it won't work on the edge function or in that case in a V8 runtime. Now you might ask me then, why should I even use the V8 runtime if I have less features than in a node runtime? Well, it's actually quite simple. You don't have any cold starts. So with Node, as I already told you, you actually have to wait for the cold start. So this could take one second or maybe also multiple seconds, depending on your bundle size. With serverless functions, they start instantly or one millisecond, something like that, but almost instantly. So when the user goes to your website and even though the serverless function is called, the website will be still served, um, I guess, instantly. Also a nice thing about that, with a node runtime, you have to choose a deployment region. So if you right now sit in San Francisco, you will probably choose San Francisco as a deployment region. And that means now for a user like me, if I'm in Germany and visit your website, I will have the problem that my request first of all has to go to San Francisco and then back to me. If I use edge functions, this does not happen because the code uh, lives on the edge. And that means if I, a user in Germany visits your website, this website will be also served from Germany. If a user from India comes, then the website will be served in India. And you as the creator, which lives in the USA, your website will be served in the US. USA. So this is a nice feature of edge functions. And as I already said, there's no clear better or worse. They have both their pros and cons. Not everything works on the V8 one time. So that's what you have to live with and you have to figure out yourself what you should use. And for example, also Prisma does not run on edge functions. And that's again, because it needs the node runtime. Now, one actual thing with Netlify is that you can choose on the route segments. So what I mean with that is if you deploy your website to Netlify, you have to actually choose for the whole deployment, what you want to use, the V8 one time or the Node one time. You can say that, for example, the index page is the Node one time and then the settings page is the edge one time. No, the whole application has to be either that or this right here. So either the node environment or the edge environment. And another thing, the bundle size of a function with Netlify is 50 MB. And honestly, 50 MB is 
very, very big and you won't need actually anymore. So that's actually fine. Let's talk about the second uh, option that's Vercel. And that's also what most of the YouTubers you see uh, on YouTube use. Um, Vercel is very nice. It's very easy to use. The UX is great. The UI is great. The only thing that is maybe not that great is the price, but that's again a separate point. But let's actually talk about what is similar or actually the same to Netlify. We again have a bundle size of 50 MB. That's again more than enough. You don't need any more. We again can choose between the Note one time or the V8 one time. So whatever you want. And now the nice thing with, with Vercel is you can actually choose the one time per route basis. So you can say with Vercel, hey, I want the index page to be a note uh, on the note one time. And then I want the settings page to be on the edge one time. So that's nice with Vercel. You can do that with Netlify. And this is actually quite cool. Then the third option which you have is Cloudflare. Now Cloudflare is actually also the basis point on which Vercel builds. So as already said, Vercel offers node functions and also edge functions. The node functions built on AWS and then the V8 functions, so the edge functions built on Cloudflare. And Cloudflare only offers edge functions. So the problem which you have now with Cloudflare is that you can't choose anymore between the node runtime or the edge runtime. You have to use the edge runtime and there's no going back in that case. And that's also, for example, why I can't deploy my applications with Cloudflare because some of my actual websites depend on the node runtime and yeah, that's why I can't use it. And also one more difference is between also Cloudflare and the Vercel, for example, um, that's that the bundle size is capped at 25 MB. Now 25 MB is still more than enough in most cases, but if your application is gigantic, you of course could run into issues. And then the last actual option, which we have is SST. Now SST is not a classic deployment provider like Netlify, Vercel or Cloudflare because you don't pay SST. SST is a framework which builds on AWS. Most people don't deploy to AWS because the UI and the UX is totally garbage. And SST actually builds on AWS and makes this whole deployment thing very, very easy. So with SST, in that case, it's free. You only pay AWS. You use the AWS Lambda function, so the node runtime, and then you get the same actual, um, I guess, benefit of the 50 MB bundle size. Also, one thing I forgot to mention is that the whole serverless landscape or all of these providers actually offer preview deployments. Uh, as you will see us in a second when we go to the long lift servers, not all providers offer actual preview deployments. And in my opinion is if you actually build a substantial website, preview deployments are very, very essential. And I use them, for example, daily. So that's one thing you should also know. Now, where we have talked about serverless landscape, let's talk about a long lived server landscape. So now let's first of all talk about fly.io. Well, fly.io actually uses containers which live on the edge. So automatically they support multi-region. Now you don't have to use multi-region. You can deploy your application in only one region, for example, the Netherlands or Germany, but you could also deploy it like a serverless function to multiple regions if you wanted to. Also one, I guess, problem which you have with fly.io, uh, you don't have any Git deploy. So as I already talked about, if you use Vercel, for example, you can just push your code to GitHub and then click import. Everything is done for you and you have to do nothing. With fly.io, it's a bit harder because you have to create a Docker file and then even if you create a Docker file, you still have to use the CLI to actually deploy your application. Now, this is not that nice or not that intuitive, but I guess you get used to it if you want to use it. I personally also use fly.io sometimes, and sometimes it gets annoying that you can't use git push and then just it will automatically rebuild. You always have to use the CLI, and as I said, it's not always that nice and intuitive. One more actual benefit that fly.io has actually in contrast to render and railway, that's static asset caching. So for example, with the serverless landscape and with the options like Vercel or Netlify, all of your static assets are automatically cached. So your images, your fonts, and whatever you use. With most long-lived server providers, it's not the same. So for example, as I say right here with Railway and with Render, they don't offer any caching. With Fly.io, the nice thing is they offer static asset caching. That means that they cache images and fonts as already said. But now that's only limited to static 
assets. You can't cache your website. So with Vercel, for example, they offer a CDN and you can programmatically use the CDN and then set the timing and whatever you want. With Fly.io, you have to use your own CDN or bring your own CDN like Cloudflare or Fastly and then do everything on your own. That's also the same for Railway and Render. Both don't offer any caching, so they don't even offer static asset caching. And you again have to bring your own CDN and do everything yourself. Now let's talk a bit about render. The nice thing with render is you have Git deploy. You can push your code to GitHub and everything is done automatically. And you also, in most cases, don't have to create Docker files. Uh, one also nice thing with render is that you can actually use preview deployments automatically. Now it's also important to mention Preview deployments only work on their paid plan, which I think costs $20 or $30. I'm not sure. You can correct me in the comments. But the nice thing is they offered if you want to pay for it. And then the last option is Railway. Now, Railway is, in my opinion, like a new kit on the block. I guess you could say it, even though they're not that new anymore. Uh, but what's the nice thing? Well, Railway you, uh, actually allows you to push your code with GitHub. So again, you don't have to create separate Docker files. Everything is done automatically for you. And then again, the bad thing, I guess, is there's no caching. So you again have to bring your own CDN, Cloudflare or Fastly or Bunny CDN, and then do everything yourself. And now where we actually looked at serverless and long-lived servers, I think you can now see a trend. So with serverless, almost everything is done for you. CDN, asset caching, um, deploying with GitHub, no Docker files, everything is done for you. With long lived servers, it's a bit different that you have to actually do everything yourself. You sometimes have to create Docker files, you have to bring your own CDN, you have to do static asset caching, sometimes you have to create your own preview deployment, uh, I guess, configuration. It's not that simple and sometimes it can be quite hard. Even for me, I sometimes have issues with fly.io with Docker files because I'm not quite a pro in that. So it can sometimes get annoying. And now you might ask me, Jen, what do you actually recommend me to use? So would you recommend you, me to use serverless or long-lived servers? And I can say it actually, I would use both. So for me, for example, I use um, serverless for my marketing site, and then I use a long-lived server, fly.io, as my backend. Um, I will actually tell you two options which I like, one from the serverless world and one from the long-lived server world. For serverless deployments, my favorite is actually Vercel. Vercel is actually quite expensive, but still what they offer is quite unmatched. The UI, UX and everything is great. The support is great. And I just like to use them. They also have, as already said, the pair route basis where you can choose between edge functions or the node runtime, which is again, very, very cool. But if, for example, I have to create something very, very big with, for example, server sent events or also, I don't know, um, polling or something like that, I will actually use, in most cases, fly.io. Uh, fly.io is actually quite cheap because they don't rely on AWS or Google Cloud or whatever it is. They have their own infrastructure, so they are, in that case, quite cheap. And they, if your bill is under $5, they won't even bill you, which is also quite nice. Also, the nice thing is that they have static asset caching. And just in general, I like fly.io a lot. So my recommendation is... If you want to use serverless, then use Vercel. If you want to use a long-lived server, then I would highly recommend you fly.io. And again, I'm not sponsored by any of these companies. I can say whatever I want to. And that's my actually unbiased uh, opinion on both providers. So now I hope you could learn something. I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope I can see you on the next video. So now enjoy your day and bye.